There are a lot of book scams out there, but the one that I'm going to talk about today is the poetry anthology scam. And I'm going to say some things that you may not like, people you know may not like, but it's the truth as I know it. And sometimes the truth is blunt and it stings and there are going to be a lot of people who say, oh, that's not true. So I'll tell you what is true. Do you remember when? When I was in high school, a long time ago, you would get something in uh, the mail that would say, oh gosh, you know, you've been selected for who's who in high school students of 1983, whatever it was, 1980. And you're all hyper, you're all delighted. We need a biography. You have to mail it in by this time. Oh my goodness, I, I'm one of many. Turns out to be hundreds of thousands. Oh, I'm one of, of the who's who in high school students. I'm so special. So you fill it out. Oh, my biography. Oh, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts. I acted in a school play. And you send it in. And then maybe a week later, two weeks, three weeks, a month later, you'll get another letter back in the mail saying, oh, you are just so special. Thank you for your biography. We'll print it in the who's who of Meow Meow. And by the way, since you're in the book, maybe you'd like to order a book for you, your family, your friends, Christmas gifts, maybe even your school. One book is $50 and a hundred books is $300, whatever. And then you slowly start to realize, oh, this is a money-making thing. This isn't about being who's who in American high school. This is about finding suckers who have big egos and who think getting their name published in a phone book sort of thing that's hardbound is going to make them famous and look good on a college resume. And these predatory companies know that. They rely on it. So you buy the book, and six months later it arrives in the mail. It looks nice. It's leather-bound, right? Embossed cover, hardcover. And every page in that book is as if it's printed on onion skin. Thin. You can see the other names on the other side of the page of the paper. And you have to do that. You have 100,000 who's who kids who are desperate to get published. In it's not going to be the good paper. It's not going to be thick paper. It's going to be the cheapest possible, thinnest paper that you can see through. So that was really, and I, was, I fell for that one time. You think you're special, and then you slowly learn, and there's nothing special about it. You're being scammed. What's the scam? Well, to me, the scam is, hey, you want to be part of this? It's going to cost you money. It's vanity publishing. And it's going on today, and it's easier to do on the Internet because it's immediate. You don't have to go back and forth in the mail. And there are a lot of places, you know, people say, you know, to, to be part of the Better Business Bureau, you have to pay a fee or you get delisted or something. I don't know. That's just what I've heard. There are other associations, your physician of the year, your dentist of the century. We're going to put your face on the cover of this magazine for orthopedic doctors. And by the way, if you want a copy of your plaque that says your physician of the year, it's $1,000. And then they get the plaque for $1,000, they put it on the wall, and all their patients look at it and say, oh my God, I have the physician of the year. And it's all a scam, it's all vanity publishing, it's all not for your benefit, but for the benefit of the people doing the scamming. So, the most notorious publishing scam 
is the Poetry Anthology. Now, I will say, being transparent, I, for many years, have published, do publish, writers, young writers, mature writers, especially on bowlsblogs.com. It's had many names. Go Inside Magazine, Urban Semiotic. Now it's Bowles Blogs. And I would publish them in exchange for the rights to publish them and for them not to publish it anywhere else electronically. That was the deal. And most authors accepted that and loved it. And there were some people who said, well, how are you making money? It's a scam. I said, I'm not scamming anybody. I've never received or asked for one penny for any of the publications that I do. Nothing. They don't believe me. It costs me money to serve. My pages where I publish other people. But because of my experience as a young writer and as a publisher, sometimes people need a break. I like working with new talent, new people. I've never asked any author for one penny. That's the difference. These other scammers, the physician scammer, the who's who scammer, the poetry anthology scammer, they're all in it to get money. And they're clever enough not to ask for the money up front. They find ways around getting money out of you. And just generally for any writer, and we've discussed this in the past, if anybody asks you for money, a publisher, a contest, a literary agency, a producer, oh, we have a processing fee. We have a reading fee. Uh, to enter our contest, you have to pay a fee. It's a scam. And there are a lot of people who fall for it, and a lot of people who pay the money, and a lot of people who don't want to realize or admit that they were ripped off. But no agent or manager or contest that is reputable and upstanding will ask you for money. They don't. They will not. It is immoral to ask you for money. Now, I do script doctoring. I edit and fix. I do not do that under my publishing arm. I do that under scriptprofessor.com. And it's very upfront. I offer you a service. You know exactly what you're getting. I'm not lying to you about anything. I'm not saying I'm going to publish your work, but I need a reading fee of $15, please. Not happening. And you talk to a lot of young writers who spend the money, and I am going to enter this contest, and if I have to pay a $50 fee, I don't care because I'm going to win $5,000. Well, where do you think that $5,000 is coming from? It's coming from all the suckers paying the entry fee. So it's a little bit like a pyramid scheme. Be careful. So many years ago, my good friend and mentor, Marshall Jameson, who worked with me on Go Inside Magazine, Bulls Blogs, Urban Semiotic, I published a lot of his poems and writing. And Marshall's an old-time guy. He used to work for CBS Television in New York, he was on Broadway, and Mr. Roberts worked as Josh Logan's assistant, directed uh, Search for Tomorrow as a TV director, had a lot of experience. And he got scammed. And I'm the one who told him. And he didn't want to believe me because he's Marshall. I'm the young uh, mentee and he isn't the mentor. And here's how it started. There's a poem that Marshall sent me for publication and he didn't want to send it to me because he said, oh, it's already being published. I said, what? What do you mean? Called A Promise Kept. This is back in 97, 19 and 97. And here's my publisher's note that Marshall wanted appended to his article. We are pleased to announce this poem after being seen in Go Inside magazine has been selected for publication in the National Library of Poetry's book, The Best Poetry of 1997. And here is the very beautiful short poem. He held her again as he had when she first told him. Then she told him again, and then he promised to marry her as soon as he was 18, and he did. 
At 22, after two more babies, and before they could conceive again, he volunteered for the Navy, took basic training in California, was assigned to Pacific duty, finally to Hawaii, and the battleship USS Arizona forever. Powerful. World War II. Beautiful. Incredible. Shocking. And so we published this article, and Marshall, I, I have this reversed, he took our article and sent it to the Library of Poetry, which was okay, because it wasn't being electronically published, it was being published in a paper thing. And so he was having a hard time getting answers out of the National Library of Poetry of when he was going to get his uh, copy of the book. So he asked me, so David, what do you know about this National Library of Poetry? So I looked it up at the time and discovered really that it was a vanity press. And this is where we're going to get into it now, because there are vanity presses out there who publish people's work for pay. And I say, if you're going to vanity publish, vanity publish it yourself. Go on Kindle, go to Amazon and publish your own book and edit it and keep it and design your cover. Don't go to some other person and pay them to publish your work. You can do it yourself. There are people on the internet who search social media. They look especially for poets because poets are very vulnerable. Uh, they're usually public and poems are short. They're easy to share, read, forward. You know, short stories, novel writers are much more close. They're not out there as much sharing their work because you can't, really can't share really even a chapter of a book because it's not a whole thing to discuss. But poems, short, go. And these poetry anthology scam people go out and find people and say, hey, oh, that's a wonderful poem. I'm going to put that in my new poetry anthology. Okay? And they usually won't ask you anything there. And you say, oh my gosh, yes, uh, do, you, do you agree to all these terms? Yes, yes, you get, keep the rights, but we keep the publishing and electronic rights. Okay, sure, 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 take it, take it, take it. And then you ask them, you know, how much do I get paid? Oh, you don't get paid anything. Well, do I get a copy of my book? Oh, sure, you get a copy of your book. Okay, great. Yeah, for $19.95. And then you know. The second they say they're going to publish your work, but you have to pay them money, you're in trouble. They don't always ask for their money right away or up front. Just like who's who, 30, 40 years ago. They played it two, three, four months before they asked you for your money. And you know if you weren't going to buy a book, you weren't going to be put in the who's who. That was the underlying thing. You did all this work, told all your friends, oh, he's in the who's who. You put it in your bio for your, you know, the playbill at the community playhouse, how important you are. And oh, if you're not going to buy a book, well, then we can't, we can't publish you then. So they force you to buy a book. So I told Marshall, well, you know, what I'm seeing about this national poet is, is sort of a, is, is a little bit of a scam. And he was very taken aback. He said, how could it be? It's the National Library of Poetry. It has to do with the Library of Congress. And I said, I bet it, 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 it really doesn't. It's really not a part of it. And so he was a little upset. Not necessarily at me, but sort of at me. And this is Marshall. Great influence. Pictures on the set of the Mark Twain series that he did for PBS. His big chief writing tablet where he wrote his poems. This is one of his poems. Wonderful man. And he sort of got taken by the National Library. Now, how could a person of Marshall Jameson's stature be taken in by one of these charlatans. Well, I'll tell you why and how. It's very interesting. <clears throat> now, I can't quite see this, but this is the National Library of Medicine website.
It's part of COVID.gov. This is an official government website. Okay. The National Library of Medicine. Now, why is that important? Well, National Library of Poetry, yes. National Library of Medicine. When Marshall Jameson was finished, hey, there's artist Dora. I was exposed to COVID on New York Day, but tested negative two times. So far, so good. Well, that's good. So Marshall Jameson, before he moved to Nebraska from New York City and sold his house in White Plains, he directed, I think, something like 300 television sort of instructional videos for young surgeons. And it was done in a hospital setting, clean setting, and he would direct surgery for recording to be shown all over the country in medical schools. And his employer was the National Library of Medicine. So when Marshall gets approached by the National Library of Poetry in his old age, said lovingly, he thought, oh my gosh, well, if it's National Library of Medicine, National Library of Poetry, they must be, must be the Library of Congress. But it wasn't. So I did a little search on National Library of Poetry to see what was going on with it. And we land on this page. This is from 10 years ago. Poetry contests, the National Library of Poetry, and amateur poetry anthologies. And Dora says, wow, I can't believe how easy it is to throw caution to the wind, including common sense. They are very talented snake oil salesmen. And as I said earlier, if you're a writer and you're being published, and they want money from you, they are not publishing you. They are taking your money. So this is very interesting. One of my jobs as a digital reference specialist, this is from the official Library of Congress website. The questions I receive tend to cluster around two or three major categories, such as how to find literary criticism on a novel and how to locate the full text of a poem without knowing its title and author. By far, the most common question I receive, however, comes from people trying to find poems that they wrote, submitted to a poetry contest, and subsequently had it published in a poetry anthology. In almost every instance, the poems in question were published by an amateur or Vanity Press poetry publisher. These for-profit publishers, which have been extremely active since the 1980s, right around the time Marshall got hit, accept nearly every poem submitted to their contests for publication. And they make money by encouraging winning poets to purchase copies of the anthologies in which their poems appear. Oh, I look like I just went offline for a second. That was weird. Someone's trying to make us shut up. We're not going to shut up. We're going to keep talking about this. So this is just like the who's who in high school America. You want to be in it? You got to pay to buy the book. So continuing, the Library of Congress has become a locus of questions about vanity press poetry publishers receiving upwards of 200 inquiries per year because many people mistakenly believe that the library itself publishes and sells these anthologies. This misconception occurs for a number of reasons. First, the names of some amateur poetry publishers are quite similar to the Library of Congress. 
One of the largest amateur poetry publishers in the 1990s and 2000s was the National Library of Poetry. I just told you about Marshall Jameson, 1997, whose name is frequently confused with the Library of Congress, or as many people refer to us, the National Library of Congress. Second, many of these publishers send emails and letters to winning poets that link their anthologies with the Library of Congress. The correspondent sometimes notes that the anthologies will be submitted to the U.S. Copyright Office at the Library of Congress, or that the anthologies will be assigned a number by the Library of Congress. People often take this to mean that the Library of Congress will add the book to its permanent collections, or will assign it an ISBN number. The National Library of Poetry, in fact, printed ISBNs on its anthologies, copyright pages, in such a way that people might assume the numbers were issued or associated with the Library of Congress. And I did a search on this yesterday as I was preparing this show, and I did a search for the National Library of Poetry, and there's no such entity anymore, which I'll show you. However, one of the first results was a poetry contest for uh, 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 young children in school. And you submit, and you pay, and we get a lot of uh, submissions. We won't publish everything. They'll publish everything. As long as you pay, they'll publish you. It's a scam. So here is the link to the National Library of Poetry from the Congress page. Again, here we are, right here. Library of Congress Research Guides. So here we go. This is the most important part. I'll put this link on our Discord server at discord.gg forward slash B-U-L-E-S. Publishers of such amateur poetry anthologies typically run regular poetry contests publicized in newspapers, magazines, and the web. That's how Marshall Jameson got caught. Almost every poem submitted to these contests is declared a semifinalist or a winner, and accepted for publication in a forthcoming anthology of winning poems. People are usually encouraged by the publisher to purchase a copy of the anthology in which their poem is slated to appear, and sometimes are notified that purchase of a copy is a requirement for their poem to be printed in the anthology. Sometimes and sometimes not. Sometimes if you don't pay, they just they cut you out. They don't tell you they're cutting you out. And then you go later and you complain and they say, oh, we made a mistake. We'll put you in the next one. By the way, here's your bill for the book. The largest publisher of Vanity Press poetry anthologies since 1980 and the one about which the Library of Congress receives the most inquiries is the International Library of Poetry, ILP. See the amateur poetry publisher sections of this guide. So there you go. You need to be very careful in dealing with the management of ego and expectation and the want to be known. When strangers approach you and start buttering you up and telling you how good you are and oh boy wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just publish your poem and you give us the rights electronically and in print and and they're working on your ego and they're working to get as much money out of you as they possibly can and one good thing, it took me a long time to figure out the National Library of Poetry was a scam in my research from Marshall Jameson. But today you can go on a website and you can look around. You can look at the facts, FAQs, and see what the questions and answers are. Uh, when you go to a publishing website and one of their services is to edit and research and print for people, you know right there that they are not a traditional publisher. 
The big publishing houses don't offer to read your manuscript or spell correct it or index it for you for a fee. They might charge you for indexing, which they definitely will, but it's not a service that they offer on their website. So that is a big key element in trying to figure out if these websites are on the up and up or not. But if an agent, a manager, a publishing house ever asks you for money as an artist, you are being scammed. You don't pay. They pay you. They get you money. You don't pay them money. And as I said earlier, they sometimes they wait until the last second to say, oh, by the way, I need a little money from you. You want a copy of this? You want access? So you can, you can ask questions. You know, is there, how much do you pay me? That's the first question you always ask. How much does it pay? And if they give you a, well, then you can keep asking questions. And if it's okay with you, okay, go ahead and do it. But don't give them any of your money. You're already giving them something of value, which is your work. But there are a lot of people who want to be writers and want to be well-known. And so they go and say, well, I can, you know, if it costs me $25, I can still say I was published by the National Library of Poetry, right? Well, you can. But then you're going to be in trouble. I remember there was a thing called Writer's Digest. It was a magazine, paper magazine, long time ago, 30, 40 years ago. And they had a lot of advertising for places like the National Library of Poetry. Oh, send us your stuff. If it's good enough, we'll publish it for you uh, for a fee. But you don't find out the fee part until later, until after you've told all your friends. So be careful out there. There are a lot of people desperate hungry, and the internet makes it very easy for them to hunt you down.